is Dr. Megan Abbott. I am the Head of Research and Development at FEM Inc. And today I will be talking to John Gersma, um, author of the recent book, The Athena Doctrine. And um, uh, John, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your book? Hey, Megan, how are you? I'm doing well. Yeah, so the, the origins of, of the book came out of a speech that I gave at an event it was hosted by Denise Morrison, and she's the CEO of Campbell Soup. Mm -hmm. It's a women's empowerment uh, networking event. And it occurred to me as I was sitting there as the only man in the room, and it was all this sort of positive uh, energy around sort of collaboration and nurturing sort of long-term thinking. It, it got me thinking that I don't know if you could put 60 guys in that room together and get the same result. Mm -hmm. So it was just a little bit of a, of a question that nagged at me as I also started to travel around the world and heard that people were talking a lot about, you know, the rise of, of the social economy, the rise of the sharing economy, and, and that, that these ideals were sort of somewhat feminine in the traditional sense. So it just started to get me thinking a little bit about this idea, and that started off to get into our research, and sort of that was kind of how the book was born. Nice. Um, so. Basically, what I mean, I know that there's been a bunch of research on how people have historically looked at, re, at, at leadership, and a lot of it seems to have to do with notions of power. Um, and certainly, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, when they tried to look at the correspondence between gender stereotypes and leader stereotypes, you saw a much greater intersection between what we think of as masculine and what we think of as corresponding to a leader. Tell, um, how do you think that's been changing over time and why? Yeah, and I guess the, the, the focus to make on this book is it's, it's about sort of the, the celebration and the, and the, I think, the anticipation that's going to come with including feminine skills and competencies that are inside all of us, men or, men or women. The, the challenge has been is that these ideals haven't really been celebrated in business or in politics in sort of the traditional sense. And what we saw when we did our interviews around the world is there was a lot of concern about sort of the state of the world, you know, questions around fairness, around leadership, around transparency, around just the size of institutions. You know, and, and in that context, one of the things we saw when we did our research was that there was this rising sort of emphasis on a more feminine leader, man or woman. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we saw that expressiveness, which people saw as feminine, was the most highly correlated with leadership. So I think it's a little bit like a, a leader who's going to really put himself or herself out there and really connect to ordinary people and their points of view. We also saw a rise in long-term thinking and patience, which when we kind of unpacked it and talked to, to people, it was this whole idea of sort of leaders that are going to think past politics and expediency and really dig into long-term challenges and problems. So there are a whole host of really interesting traits that were far more correlated with the ideal modern leader. Things like selflessness, empathy, collaboration, sharing credit, flexibility. And most uh, people around the world saw those as more feminine. Now there are still some masculine ideals that were really important. You know, they saw resiliency, sort of strength, um, determination, um, you know, those types of ideals were seen as a little bit more in the, in the ways of men. But there was one really great data point that we got out of our research. There was 81% of people around the world in 13 countries said, man or woman, you need both masculine and feminine traits in order to thrive in today's world. So it's really a story about balance, and that's really what this book is about. Oh, no, that's pretty incredible. Um, so there's there's this sort of I feel like there's a bit of a disconnect between what makes a good leader and what people see of as, like, what people think of as the stereotypical leader, and that I think has to do with some some of what it, uh, some of what at least I saw as your book is saying is that there's been this evolution, this change over time, um, and how long do you think it'll take for, um, for what we project as what sort of the ideal leader to match what we think of as, as what makes sort of a typical leader? 
Yeah, and you know, one of the things we're doing right now are sort of a lot of workshops using the the insights from the data, but as well as the hundred innovators that we met all around the world. We basically spent three years talking to some of the most amazing leaders, whether they were doing NGOs or working, um, you know, as diplomats and or in, even leaders of Fortune 500 companies. But I think the, the key thing here is that this is really making an, an emergent form of leadership, it's not necessarily widespread. And a lot of the really interesting women and men that we met were sort of, you know, innovating by really bringing their feminine competencies into into fold. And so, you know, I'll give you an example. There was a, a guy we met in Berlin named Dr. Ayad Madish, mm -hmm. and he is got a PhD in virology and he's really, really smart, but he told me that he kept getting stuck in his experiments. And when he went around to his colleagues uh, at Harvard for, for help, they kind of said to him, boy, you, you look a little foolish, you know, by <laughs> admitting these types of things, you know, you look a little silly. And he realized that, you know, there needed to be a, a format that was more open and collaborative. So he started ResearchGate and he now has, um, Two million scientists from 200 different countries that are basically collaborating on 800,000 different research projects. So here's an example of a guy being vulnerable and being honest. And that was really the type of people we met, these very innovative people who were just being human. You know, they were bringing mm -hmm. human sides into their thinking. That's really cool, right? Because at the, cause the, the way you're sort of telling the story is that the first, the first sort of impression was just like, you shouldn't be doing that. But then he went and created something do and on some level that's that's kind of a, a greater like well I guess that's what you mean by an emergent form of leadership it's not typical yet but it's something that seems to be increasingly important um, so how do you think that this like you were mentioning the sort of more social world how do you think that technology and the way technology has changed the way we do business the way we do science how do you think that plays into the greater importance of these traditionally feminine characteristics? I think it's just, you know, hugely important. We saw very innovative entrepreneurs using social to drive new business models. We met, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Emily Bolton from Social Finance in the UK, and they're designing social impact bonds using uh, a whole host of sort of community building to sort of help um, drive you know, social good through sort of private investing work, private investor work. We also um, spent time in, in Israel with Yadin Kaufman, and he's, uh, he's one of the co-founders of Veritas Ventures, and he's designed a very innovative uh, program, a joint cooperation um, between Israelis and Palestinians for young tech startups um, to build them up in, in, into Ramallah. And so, you know, I just think you're seeing lots of interesting collaboration. We saw it and a bunch of different interesting business models where sort of not only collaboration but but transparency come into fold. Um, we were in Stockholm and one of the stories that what was one of my favorites in the book were the founders of Bamboozer who have live video that basically gets you know broadcast straight onto your social web and they thought they were designing sort of an innovative platform that was about entertainment but what they found out is that all these little videos were basically being used to document, um, you know, the Arab Spring, for example, in Tahir Square. And these guys were shut down before Twitter was in Egypt. So, you know, that power of, of technology is now creating just incredible transparency and sort of the instant community. That is a key thing that leaders have got to think about as they start to manage. They can't manage in a command and control sort of opaque way. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And I, I like that a lot, like your examples of people who are demonstrating these quote-unquote feminine qualities, it seems like they're almost equally likely to be men or women. Yeah, and they're just, they're common sense things, but I think what's making them so novel is that they're not sort of leading by following existing paradigms. You know, Dr. Maddish, he took on science because he said it's too egotistical. You know, the guys from Bamboozer are sort of, they, they admitted that they sort of stumbled into it, but they realized that their business model was really about sort of openness and transparency for, for people. And so, you know, I think these are the, the realities that any leader is facing today. And, you know, the, the most innovative people we saw sort of around the world realized that sort of the, the world is tilting in a way that really favors these traditional, um, what have been referred to as traditional feminine 
cores and, and skills, competencies rather, and it's a great time to use them. So what I try to do is I try to kind of think about advocacy for women and girls in a slightly different context by really encouraging men to understand and believe that these are forms of innovation, right? Yeah. They're forms of competitive advantage. And so by sort of you know, getting into this discussion, hopefully we can you know, bridge gender divides and, and get everybody to see the powerful role that, that these, these values play. Yeah, it's sort of interesting. Um, two weeks ago, the people that we had on um, included Gloria Felt, and she was looking at this from another another angle, which is that one of one of the reasons that a lot of women are not attracted to positions of power are because of the way they see leadership as being a more con command and control sort of thing, as opposed to being more collaborative and being more about um, working towards a goal. And it seems as though so it's sort of complementary to your approach where thinking about leadership, not just what's um, what women might be interested in or men might be interested in, but in terms of what's effective is more along the lines of things that are collaborative and working towards a goal. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting. In our data, we ask people in 13 countries, and the two human skills or traits that were least correlated with modern leadership in the eyes of the public were ego and aggressiveness. Wow. So we thought that was really interesting, you know? And, and so when we went and talked to these leaders around the world, it wasn't like they were all like soft skills. This wasn't yeah. just about collaboration and everyone hanging out and having a good time. I mean, these people were actually up against really systemic challenges, you know, really big obstacles, but they were just sort of tapping into their they had the courage of their convictions and their humanity to sort of tap in um, to solving a problem in a new way. I mean, you know, we were in Kenya, which is an economy in, in dramatic transition. We were in Colombia, where there's just been systemic levels of, you know, of violence and civil war. And yet we met leaders that were just kind of thinking differently about the entire approach to, to how to break through these problems. And there's some really big changes that are positive that are happening in Colombia. You know, we met the, um, the number two guy at, in the Medellin uh, City Council and the government, and they have devoted 62% of their operating budget to people under 30. So it's this great example of long-term thinking, you know, after-school programs, education, how can they break these cycles of violence in a way that really get us to think about problems in a new way. So yeah, I think one of the, the greatest things about your book is the fact that you have this international focus. Did you see any big differences about these emerging economies where in some sense they're, they're facing these larger challenges um, than, than the developed world. What, what, did, did you see major differences between how people thought about leadership both in the ideal and in the typical? Yeah, I, I think you know, we read so much about you know, the, the, the challenges, the social challenges in, in emerging markets and I guess we were quite intrigued to see how many innovators there were in these fast growing markets. You know, some of my favorite interviews were in India, they were in China, um, you know, they were in Colombia, as I mentioned, and I and definitely in Kenya. You know, we, we spent time with, um, you know, Bob Collymore, who's the CEO of Safaricom, and they've got literally 62% of the entire Kenyan economy is now sort of flowing off of M-Pesa, off of texting. And so that's been able to eliminate corruption and extortion, and that's created a whole host of new business models that are based on community. So there is a little bit of this jumping of infrastructure yeah. thing that's happening in a lot of the fast-growing markets. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of challenges still there, obviously. But I just think people are sort of, you know, throwing out some of the preconceptions of the old rules and trying to, trying to lead in new ways and taking advantage of a lot of these technologies. Wow. Um, so, who is, yeah, I mean, it, you have all these amazing examples. Um, what were the reasons when people were saying that ego and aggressiveness were the, the sort of, you know, the least correlated, what were the reasons they gave for saying that these were actually bad things for I, uh, ideal leaders when you talked to them? Well, you know, it's just so hard to be sort of me, me, me in a, in a we, we, we world, right? Yeah. I think. Part of that is, you know, it's, it's quite practical. A lot of this adjustment, and when we talk about leadership, you know, you could talk about this just, you know, you're thinking about your career and you're managing a, a small team. 
you know, I think everybody has to understand that these skills are so vital today. They're, they're a reflection of where most of our country's economies are going. You know, we're moving from manufacturing to sort of a services-based economy that requires listening, communication, nuance. And so I think a lot of, of these skills are sort of embedded or imprinted in what people think are just gonna be necessary um, skills to, in order to thrive in the future. So, you know, it, it's interesting. We, um, we've gotten really good reaction to the book. We've gotten some good criticism, which has been a lot of fun too. And I think the the really exciting thing about it is there's sort of a, a complementary approach even to, you know, what Sheryl Sandberg is, is writing about in, with Lean In, which is, you know, our view too is that in business, politics, societies kind of have to lean in to the ways of women, you know, that there, there's huge opportunities here for, um, for people to take advantage of, of these, um, these core skills and competencies that, that heretofore have kind of been thought of as sort of things that we think about outside the workplace. Yeah. I mean, there are also things that, that I think sort of in a previous era were thought of as signs of weakness, kind of going back to um, your example with the founder of ResearchGate. Um, yeah. so that, you know, you look, you, look, you look kind of bad when you're coming around saying, exactly. I don't understand this, I'm stuck, let's talk. Um, so when you're talking about education and looking at women and girls and boys, um, how do you think we could structure education in the way, or any of these things, um, the way we talk about leadership in a public dialogue to start encouraging these more? Yeah, I mean, what I'm committed to is sort of a, a full long-term advocate uh, platform for, for leadership. And the two things that I'm affiliated with that I think are just awesome programs are the United Nations Girl Up campaign, mm -hmm. which I'm going to be down there in, in D.C. Uh, speaking at their summit on June 10th. But here you have just some of the most amazing, you know, young girls that are, are being sort of mentored and, and taught through ways that they can really drive change in their own communities and, and be leaders of the future. But the other thing I am doing is I'm working closely with um, the Athena Center for Leadership at Barnard College. And there's a great group of uh, people up there, both alumni and a lot of uh, great men that really support this ideal. And we're going to try to connect those two and really sort of think through a, a longer term sort of emergent leadership uh, platform for people to really take these skills into the workplace. So we do workshops with corporations off the book and we're, we're just encouraging far more openness of discussion on this so that you realize that, that these values, these skills are just so essential to, to competition and actually, you know, ROI in your own yeah. company. No, I think there have been a number of studies that have shown that when you have more women on boards, when you have more women involved in governments, you have uh, you have better outcomes, and what's sort of interesting about your study is now, now it's not just a correlation of number of women to outcomes. It's it's a why. It's a why do you why do you see this as as? Yeah, no, absolutely, and I also think that um, it's been interesting. Some of the best reactions I've gotten to the book have been from men, particularly young men, that have come up to me after a talk or something and said, you know, wow, I, I feel like I can kind of be myself at work. I should actually put my personality out there more because I feel like I have to conform to the to the culture of the office or something. And that was really the theme we saw around the world. These leaders, they were just being human. Mm -hmm. You know, I, Dr. Maddish was being vulnerable. You know, um, you know, in the case of, of some of the other people we met, you know, we got the chance to spend time with uh, President of Israel, Shimon Peres, and he talked about, he had this great quote. He had just come back from spending time with Cheryl Sandberg and Mark uh, Zuckerberg uh, in California, and he was all excited about Facebook, and he thought about the implications for world political leaders. And he said this great quote, which I, I'll not, I don't think I'll ever forget, but he said, we're in a new world with many old minds. Yeah. And the challenge of a leader is to adapt yourself. And that, you know, that he's thinking about that at, at age 89, I think is a, a quite remarkable lesson for all of us. And the fact that we've all got to be students and we've all got to think through the, the sort of changing nature of what's just happening around us. So it's by no means the Athena Doctrine isn't a mainstream concept in corporations, but I do think it's the start of, of what could be really positive in the future. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, since we're, we're coming to the end, uh, I was just wondering, how did you end up at that meeting that, that started this whole journey? Oh, yeah, right. So, um, oh, the, the meeting with, um, with Denise Morrison? Or yeah. Morris. yeah. She invited me, and I had, had written a previous book on post-crisis consumerism and mm -hmm. called Spend Shift, and she invited me to, to come and talk at, at her forum, and I just thought, wow, there's, there's something here. I've been married for 20 years, but I feel like I know a little bit of, about uh, how to think, think like women, but I far, I far don't know enough. That's clear. Well, I mean, I think that part of what, you know, what you've been saying is that um, it's not as though these are the exclusive domain of women. And in some sense, I mean, I have, I have a very young son. So um, how old is he? Uh, he, he turned two in February. So yeah, but um, it's interesting to sort of watch him grow up and what and I, you know, I, I'm a girl, I've been a feminist for the larger part of my life, I hadn't really thought about how some of these stereotypes around masculinity can really constrain men and young boys until I had a son. And I started sort of looking at him and thinking, wow, there are, there are some things that are, that are kind of hard about these masculine stereotypes that are really restricting that um, I hadn't thought about before, before I had a son, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we went into Stockholm and we interviewed the, um, the directors of the Agalia preschool, which is sort of touted as the first uh, gender neutral preschool. And their whole idea was just in those early formative years when kids are so creative and so curious to just not put a box around them, you know, so they try to just do everything around letting everybody do, you know, anything they want to do in the context of not putting sort of constraints on, on, well, boys are supposed to act like this and girls are supposed to act like this. And there's an awesome Ted talk by Sir Ken Robinson on this concept of, you know, creativity. And that's really what they were trying to do with this preschool is just make sure that, you know, these kids are, are keeping their minds as open and as expansive as possible. All right. Yeah. And I think, I think that's actually something that's useful for us all so that we can get to these feminine and the positive masculine traits that you talked about, like resilience and honestly, just a lot of things about having sort of faith in yourself, which I think we, we encourage more in men than women culturally, but are still super important. Um, I think, yeah, getting rid of these boxes and allowing all of us to tap into these important qualities is, is super, super important for any economy, but certainly the evolving, interconnected, transparent economy that we're moving into. That's absolutely correct. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're almost at 3.30, so um, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um, and, huh? Thank you, it was so much fun, Megan. Yeah, and thank you for, thank you for the work that you've done, the, like, you, I mean, everyone should actually like go and find this book. It's it's amazing, and they've collected this extensive, comprehensive data set that, um, as a scientist, I, I kind of drool a little over. <laughs> well, go, we've uh, we've posted all the data on the website on athenadoctrine.com, and um, the other thing I just say is that all proceeds of the book go to support the Girl Up campaign. So if you check out uh, www dot girl up dot org. It's just an awesome program. Thank you, John. Thank you, Megan.